TMZ TV. We're going. All right, uh, we're, we're going to have some snacks back here after lunch. I should, we should have had snacks here this morning, but I didn't. I didn't mention you guys. <laughs> These guys, this is the first concert, but it is a fantastic job. All right, it's time for some snacks. Thank you. Thank you. It's hard work. I, I uh, sponsored a conference for 13 years in Willard, Ohio, but I had two secret weapons. My wife and my mother-in-law. They really got that. They cooked and they did all kinds of stuff. And it was 13 years in a row, so people could count on it. It was always the second week of June, and so there was like maybe 60 people every every summer. Because, uh, yeah, because people knew it was coming. And my father-in-law, I just got to tell you real quick. My, my father-in-law is so funny. My wife's maiden name is White. His name is Art White. He's the one, in 1982, when I went on my, it was a blind date, really. I had never met this woman before. I, worked, I was working at a hospital in 1982. I was a nurse's aide, and orderly, more like disorderly. But anyway, I, was, I, was, I befriended this woman who had cerebral palsy, and uh, her name was Anita Watson. She's no longer with us, but um, I got friendly with some of the patients, and she lived in Alliance, Ohio, which is only about 20 miles from where I lived, in Canton, Ohio. She said, will you come visit me when I go home? I said, yes. <laughs> so I did, and I remember she had this picture on top of her fireplace, almost like a shrine, and it was a f giant photograph of this girl, and I looked at her, and the first thing I said, I really, I said, is she for real? <laughs> it's not so perfect. And that was my, my future wife, and... Uh, I asked her where she lived. I said, where does this girl live? Well, she lives in Plymouth, Ohio. Where's Plymouth, Ohio? I, I never heard of it. Well, you should go visit her. I said, wait, slow down. I don't even know where Plymouth, Ohio is. So I went home to my Ram McNally Road at me. And this would determine my future, where Plymouth, Ohio was. In my mind, I'm thinking, hey, well, within 100 miles, maybe I'll go for it, you know? So I think the, the coordinates were NJ13. I looked in the back of the... To, Plymouth, NJ-13, so you know you go down NJ-13, finding out where Plymouth, Ohio is, and say, well, it's only 75 miles away, I'm going to go for it. And that's why I'm here today, because it was my future father-in-law. I hardly even walked in the door, he's coming at me with a Young's Concordance. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Um, he wants to know what time to expect us for lunch. Uh, 12... 1215 to 1230? 1250. Okay. 1230 maybe. So he's the one. He's the one. My future father showed me. It wasn't the first time I was there. It was the second time I was there. I would go there on every other weekend when I was off from the hospital. It was out in the country, way out in the country. It was a different world for me. I was a city kid, lived in the suburbs. and This was like Mayberry. <laughs> Dad was playing the guitar on the porch, and her mom was putting pizzas in the oven, homemade pizzas, and there was like... Big family over there, the Waltons. It was the Waltons. I just loved it there. And he was showing me, he took me that concordance out. He said, this book has every word in the Bible. I said, no, it doesn't. <laughs> then he showed me the word God. It's like, page after page. Okay, it's got every word in the Bible. So I didn't understand the significance of it. I was a Christian at that time. I got my first Bible in 1979, New American Standard Bible, and I read it a couple times and thought I understood it. But <laughs> he showed me this word I own, how it's, how it's mistranslated. And I didn't understand the significance of it until he passed me a book called The Restitution of All Things by Andrew Jukes. Tough read. It's a tough read. It's archaically written, written in the late 1800s, but there are just so many facts there. If you really want a hardcore book into the salvation of all, that's the book that got it for me. There's just too many facts, too many scriptures. It's like, it's undeniable after I read that book. So. I owe my father-in-law for that, my ex-father-in-law. Anyway, um, I, was got, I had a whole talk planned, and I'm throwing it out because of a question I was asked five minutes ago. <laughs> yeah, that's how it works here. You're on it, man. Yeah, man. <laughs> and the question is something everybody probably, I've talked about this before, but it's a question somebody, that people have in their minds. I mean, to us, Paul's words in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 about this fantastic thing called the snatching away, it seems so incredible. 
It's almost it's it's simple, but it's it's difficult to believe. Very simply worded. You all know the passage. I should just read it for the sake of people on the. But a question was asked concerning what happens to our loved ones who aren't believers, who are. I hate to use this term because of the Christian connotation, left behind. Mm -hmm. What the Christians don't realize is that they're all going to be left behind. Five years, three years after the snatching away, they're still going to be looking for the snatching away. Just like 2,000 years after the coming of Christ, the Israel types are still looking for the coming of Christ. They're still looking for it. They missed it. Likewise, those who are in organized religion, nominal Christians, believers in name only, they don't believe Paul's message. You heard testimony of our friend Phil here. They hate grace. It seems un- it, it, the whole scenario that the Christians paint and the popular movie Left Behind s- series, who who wrote that? That was Sonny. Yeah. 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 Hal Lindsey. No. Hal Lindsey. Hal Lindsey was one of the ones. Late Great Planet Earth, right? Ferretti. I, I read all that stuff. Ferretti? Frank Ferretti. Frank Ferretti. Okay. Oh, Left Behind. That scenario is not going to happen. It's not going to happen. No scenario where, oh, every airline pilot is a Christian, don't you know? Every bus driver is a Christian. And so they're all going to be raptured away, and the world's going to be in chaos. Planes will be crashing. Buses will be crashing. And the, uh, it'll just be like an apocalyptic world smoke and flames and it's going to be a horrible crisis and the world's going to wonder what happened folks that is the farthest thing from the truth because as in Paul's day there were very few people who believed this truth it seems strange doesn't it because it's so simple the death of Christ for sin is entombment and his resurrection from the dead what could be more simple well until Satan comes on and complicates everything and puts trip wires in front of every essential truth of that and causes people to think that they understand the truth, but don't. I've been able to do that. I don't want to talk about that in detail now, but there are very few members of the body of Christ. So, in my humble opinion, if I, they're out there, I'd like to know where. Not that I know everybody, not that you know everybody, but we know a lot of people who aren't, and we know why they're not, because they're religious. And they enjoy their works, and they mix the two Gospels, and they're self-righteous, and they believe that they save themselves by, by believing, and these things don't belong to our Gospel. So the question is, what happens to those who are nominal Christians, as most people are, or flat-out unbelievers? As I said, there are two kinds of unbelievers. This was a shock to me. Many of you have heard me say this many times. Two kinds of unbelievers. Worldly unbelievers and religious unbelievers. Same category. That's a shock. Think about it. Every time we hear unbelievers, we think of, you know, people go to bars and rough people and they're just sinners and they don't believe in God. And Well, okay, that, that, that's an unbeliever. But also, the people in church who are worshiping a false god and a false Christ, a god who is really waiting to find out what his creatures are going to do, a savior who tried to save people but couldn't do it. They're unbelievers too. They're just religious unbelievers. They're worse. I was thinking the same thing. They're worse. They're worse. <clears throat> Waylon knows this. They're worse than the worldly unbelievers. I would much rather talk to an atheist <laughs> any day. Because at least I'll give the atheist credit for this. They haven't swallowed the crap. They haven't swallowed the lies of religion. They know. They have the intellect, honest, the intellectual honesty to understand that this is bunk. This is crazy. I can talk to that. I can reason with that. But the Christian unbelievers, the ones that went to the Baptist church, the seminary, they have their... They're, they're worshiping the, the false God, the false Christ, the failure Christ, the, the, the uh, hapless God. Those people, you can't make any inroads with them. It's a miracle. Saul the Pharisee. Isn't this interesting? I just thought of this. You have Saul the Pharisee who was convinced he had everything worked out. And he was the cream of the crop. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, a Benjamite. 
educated at the feet of Gamaliel. Yep. And so, it, what did it take to change him? What did it take? It take a violent act of God. It wasn't an exercise of the man's free will, that's for sure. <laughs> violent act of God. And yet, when he was converted after this violent act of God, and that's what it takes, he goes to the Greeks. He goes to people who maybe have heard of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but probably not. He goes to people who are worshiping idols, and he tells them that there is a God, and he's your God too, and he sent his son to die for you, and you're saved in spite of what you do. And they say, oh, that sounds good. That's the worldly unbeliever. The worldly unbeliever becomes a believer like that, just hearing somebody finally present a clear message, not trammeled with the religious gobbledygook of works and free will and eternal torments and, as Phil said, all the things you have to do, all the live like Jesus type stuff. Yeah, like I always say, I have to live like Jesus? Can I start on Monday? I'd like to enjoy the weekend. <laughs> yeah, so... So, no, the, well, the snatching away is going to be a very quiet event. My friend Charlie Cronk, who's a precious member of the body of Christ, he died probably eight years ago. <sighs> hate death, hate it. Anyway, he told me, he told me more like 5,000 people a day come up missing in the United States. On, on, on a regular basis. Do you know anything about him? You heard anybody missing today? No. 5,000 a day on average come up missing. If there's only 1,000 members of the body of Christ, what kind of ripple do you think that's going to make? But back to my main point. Somebody wanted to know, well, my, my daughter is a believer, but her young children are not. Well, this is the first thing I would answer to that is, I believe that a two-year-old or a three-year-old can understand the essentials of the gospel. I, I do. And I've written a book, as you know, about that, and my illustrators having some illustrating blockages issues. But um, it's, it's, if you have young children, sit them down. It's your responsibility, relatively speaking, to bring them the truth. Young children, grandchildren. But if you have grandchildren, you got to get through the parent. <laughs> you got to be careful there because if you start talking to your grandkids and the parent doesn't like it, then you could be. That's a scary thing, to be written out of the family. If you talk to my daughter one more time, you're never coming over to see her again. That happens to people. That's scary. That's evil, too. Talk to them. Present them the simple truth, as Waylon says. The simple truth. Mm -hmm. They're not too young. Well, let's, okay, let's get a worst case scenario. But the questions I've been asked, you, you wouldn't believe. I've been asked, Martin, what happens if a woman is pregnant and she's in the body of Christ and the snatching away occurs while the baby is in utero? I'm the only guy that gets these questions. Do you think anybody in mainstream orthodoxy gets these questions? No, I get these questions. But I tackle, I'm not afraid of these questions. And here's my answer. I'm just going by the word of God. I'm not going by emotions. I'm not going by what I think, what I hope. But I'm just saying what is what I believe to be the truth. And if you, you might not like it, but I'm going to sort it out for you right after I say this. I was asked this question, and I said, "I said, well, that's a life in there. That's a human being. But there's no way that human being can be a believer. To believe is an acceptance of, of a teaching." Those who, have been, those who have been chosen beforehand to believe will believe. But there's no such thing, and I've been asked this a, a, a lot of times. Well, Martin, couldn't it be that if they had lived longer, then they would have been a believer? So can't we just say that that baby in utero is a believer because if they had grown up and come to here, they would be a believer? This is my answer to that. What is the difference? between a one-month-old who is an unbeliever and a 50-year-old who is an unbeliever. Nothing. The 50-year-old is just as oblivious to the things of God as the one-month-old or the baby in the womb. The 
The fact is that if God has chosen someone beforehand for membership in the body of Christ, that individual will hear the message sometime during their life. There's no such thing as, I don't know, projecting it forward. Okay, saying, well, they, they would. No, it's... So I told that woman, well, forgive me, but you will be snatched away, but your baby won't be. Don't ask me how that works out practically. It's not my, not my department. Uh, the gentleman that spoke to me before I stepped up here was asking about that. And it's a good, great question because if we have the love of God in us, we don't want to leave our kids. You don't want to leave your pets. You don't want to, some people don't want to leave the earth. I mean, it's just there's a lot of emotional attachments. Here. God understands that. God understands that. And I'll start by saying this. Nothing God will do will disappoint you. Number one. Number two, God loves your children way more than you do. I know it's hard for some people to believe. Because, well, no, who could be better than me? Well, you know, I'm sorry, but there might be somebody better than you. Might, I don't know. Maybe God. That's number two. And number three, and this is not something that is not in the Word of God, I've said this before, and I truly believe it. And I'll tell you why I believe it, three reasons. I believe that after we're snatched away, we are coming back to help our loved ones. I was going to read that passage, wasn't I? First Thessalonians 4, We who remain to the coming of the Lord will not outstrip the dead. At the shout, oh, I can't, I can't even get through it. It's so great. At the shout of God, the shout of the Son of God, the command, the dead will rise first. Thereupon, we the living, I told you that the flood of Noah happened on a Thursday afternoon. This is going to be a Tuesday afternoon. I mean, it's that real. I want you to think of it in practical terms. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Thereupon, we who are living, who are surviving to the presence of the Lord, will at the same time be snatched away together with them in clouds, in the air, and there we shall be forever with the Lord. Comfort one another with these words. So simple. That's one of the clearest passages Paul ever wrote. That guy wrote a lot of unclear passages, if you ask me, but he was so clear here. Just It's simple. Hard to believe because it's so fantastic. So fantastic. We're going to be standing there one day, and now you see him, now you don't. Now you see him, now you don't. It's an instant. Mm -hmm. An instant in the Greek is atomos. A is un. Tomos is cut, uncut. It's the uncuttable time. It's like atomic time. It's like you can't even measure it. That's how fast it's going to happen. And the earth's not going to know about it, but certainly your loved ones will. Of course they will. But what did Jesus do after he raised from the dead? That's the equivalent I'm giving you, Jesus Christ raising from the dead. Did he go up to heaven and say, oh, good luck. <laughs> good luck during the persecution. Good luck. No. He loved his disciples. And so he tarries with them after he raised from the dead, he goes with, to be with the Father. His blood is presented. And he comes back for 40 days. That's nice, isn't it? And he helps them. He talks to them. And he shows himself to 5,000 people alive for our benefit. These people are going to, I know I'm asking them to, to have faith, but I'm going to give their faith some assistance. I'm going to show myself to 5,000 people. After I'm raised from the dead. How cool is that? So, likewise, Joseph and his brothers. Does Joseph forget his brothers? No. So, and one more thing. I don't have the verse reference here, but you know it's there. Read the whole Bible, you'll find it. It's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, one that says, God will do above and beyond everything we're able to hope and think. Every, anything we're able to hope and think. Any idea we have of how great it's going to be, how wonderful it's going to be, of how glorious and gracious it's going to be, God is going to exceed that. All right, so here I am telling you that after we're snatched away, we're going to come back and assist our loved ones through. Okay, I just came up with that. Me, a weak, mortal human being, eating an apple and a banana. And I'm telling you that. Is that as good as it gets? Am I crazy to think that? Is that too good? No, God is going to exceed that. 
So whatever you hope and dream for your family, God's going to exceed it. Going to exceed it. So you can't. Don't worry about it. It, it comes to trust. It comes to trust. You wanted to talk about trust? Look at Abraham and Isaac. Huh? Take your son up the top of Mount Moriah and kill him as a sacrifice for me. What? Say again? Right? That's almost what's being asked of you. That's really what's being asked of you. Do you know why Abraham did it? This was his childlike faith. His faith was so simple and stupid and childlike that he knew this was the promised son and he knew that God would exceed his expectations. So in his stupid, simple, lovely, believing mind, as soon as he withdrew the knife, the kid would come back to life. That's his faith in God. Now that's on the level of faith of Peter walking, stepping on the boat. That's the level of faith. And Peter's the stupidest guy. The reason Jesus called Peter out because he's the stupidest one. <laughs> That's why. He's the stupidest one. Who has the stupidest faith here on this boat? Uh, Peter. <laughs> and he's the stupidest one because he's the one that says, Lord, have me come out on the boat. He's looking at his boat. He's, ha, ha, ha. Jesus said, okay, come on out. Really? Put your, Put your money where your mouth is, boy. So he did. He stepped out of the boat and started walking on the water. So that's the kind of faith he had. God delivered. Abraham is the faith to believe God when he says, you're going to make the father of many nations, even though he has no son. He says, okay, sounds good. Just like those Greeks, Paul told him, you're justified. None of your sins count against you. Oh, sounds good. Abraham, take your son Isaac up. Don't worry, I'm going to take care of things. Sounds good. Nah, but that was still tough, you know. He knew that God would deliver him. Well, he didn't. He did deliver him. He didn't have to go through it, but he was willing to do it. So you're being asked to do that with your family, even those adults that you know. What's the difference between a one-month-old and an adult who doesn't doesn't believe the evangel? You're being asked to believe. You're being asked of stupid faith that the God who parted the Red Sea, who Raises the dead. Raises the dead. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Who caused Peter to walk on the water. That God who created the universe. That God has promised you. That he loves you. And that everything works together for your good. Everything. You going to deliver that to him? Only God can generate that faith, but I'm trying to help him. Gener I'm trying to help him. I'm giving him a canvas to write on. Okay, I paint it. Now you give him the faith. Give him the faith to believe that. To let your kids go. Let your grandkids go. They're only on loan to you. You know that. I've heard that many times when I was raising my kids. I actually believed it. I don't know why. Just, I have stupid faith just like, like Peter, I guess. But I knew they were on loan to me the whole time I was raising them. I had three, three sons. And I have two sons who are unbelievers. One's a religious unbeliever and one's a worldly unbeliever. One's an atheist and one's in the Christian religion. There you go. And one of them's an actual believer. I got one of each. Thanks, God. One of each. <laughs> God says you're going to have three sons. What do you want? I'll take one of each. <laughs> no, I didn't ask for that. Well, I got one of each. Religious unbeliever, spiritual uh, worldly unbeliever, and an uh, actual believer. I raise them all the same. It's not like I was a good father for the first and third one, I really, you know. No, it's the same. They, I, I believed this truth before they were even born. So they came up right from the beginning. I took them to all the conferences. I went everywhere with my family. My theory was, why get married if you don't want to spend time with your wife? I'm all for togetherness. I'm into that. <laughs> so I would take my family everywhere. I take up 90% of the conferences I went to, I took my family. So. And then they heard it from me at home, too. And then I lived the truth perfectly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Who said yeah? You have me. Who's not? <laughs> yeah, well, I tried. Yeah. But anyway, so what time is it? Do I have? 12.03. Okay, one more thing to say. Because it's a related question. So anyway, just trust God with your loved ones. No, I'm actually going to save this. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to talk about this afternoon so you come back. 
<laughs> We're going to have more testimonies. More beautiful people who have been through things and have come the hard way to God just like you all have. So I love hearing from these people. Love it. I'm going to talk about the salvation of all. I'm going to give you the prelude to 1 Corinthians 15. We always go to 1 Corinthians 15, 22. As in Adam, all are dying. Thus also in Christ shall all be vivified. I'm going to take the prelude. I'm going to show you what built up to that. And I'm also going to tell you, based on the question I was asked, what happens to unbelievers at the great white throne? How do they get justified? How do they come to God? I'm also going to talk about the rich man, uh, not the rich man, but uh, the raising of Lazarus. Wow, there's so many cool details in John 11, the raising of Lazarus. So that's a little preview. And then I'm going to have another speaker here. Who is it? You, sir. I am and you, it. sir. Um, these gentlemen are going to either today or tomorrow. We have we're going to be here tomorrow. I vote for tomorrow. You vote for tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, you're okay, you're on tomorrow. What about you, young man? Uh, I I can do it if you want me okay, to. Okay, all right. So right now we're going to go to, to the guys. Give us the the tiki guy. Uh, yes, he said uh, just walk in for lunch today. Okay, so everybody go to the tiki. You guys have already been there. I haven't been there yet. <laughs> So we're going to take you. You don't have to. Do your own thing for lunch. If you want to take a nap, do whatever you want. We'll be back here at 2 p.m., and then we'll take things from there. Don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. So, all right, thank you very much for your time and attention. What are the times tomorrow? Yes, sir, what are the times tomorrow? Uh, <coughs> basically, 9 to noon. 9 to noon. Yeah, we're doing a half day tomorrow. I used to start at 9.30 on Sunday because people are tired, but no. Yeah. No. 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 no, I want everybody here at 9. <laughs> we're here. I mean, we, we go hard. On these times, we go hard because that's why you're here. We don't do this very often. It's hard to get here, so we're not going to be screwing around. I mean, I mean rested, no, forget, no, no, rest, no, 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 forget about it. All right, so we'll see everybody back here at, at two or thereabouts. Thank you.